right. Good morning. It is a pleasure to introduce to you guys Daryl McCallum. Daryl is a partner at Shaw Rosenthal LLP. And um, also, I have to say he's a board member for BBB Greater Maryland, and Shaw Rosenthal is a valued, treasured, accredited business. A few things you should know about Daryl. He's a Maryland super lawyer, 2017 through 2021. And I want to mention only 5% of attorneys in Maryland receive this distinction. So what an honor it is to have him with us. He's a former chair of the Maryland State Bar Association Labor and Employment Section Council. And he's a member of the National Employment Law Council comprised of leading minority management side labor and employment attorneys. But I think this is the biggest and best credential of all. I'd like to say Daryl was once a disc jockey at his college radio station back in the 1980s. So I think that qualifies him to present right there. So without any further ado, I'd love to welcome Daryl McCallum. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you so much, Andy, for that um, nice introduction. And I, I really appreciate it. And I'm uh, happy to be able to uh, make this presentation today. Um, we are all uh, we, we've turned the page. We're, uh, it's now April. It's opening day of baseball. And I know a lot of us are, are really happy to see things starting to take shape uh, like they were not able to do last year. So I'm very happy uh, to be able to present this to you today uh, on COVID, make this presentation on COVID vaccines. Um, we're going to give you some practical guidance for uh, navigating this uh, time period as we uh, recover from uh, what's been going on over the last year with the pandemic. Let's go to the next slide. First, I have to uh, read a little disclaimer here. Uh, obviously, uh, we're making this presentation for the BBB, um, but uh, the opinions expressed here are, are gonna be my opinions um, and uh, and we are, our presentation doesn't create an attorney-client relationship. Um, and uh, you should know that the, again, the opinions expressed here will be mine. Uh, I'm not speaking on behalf of the BBB of Greater Maryland uh, or on behalf of the firm. So next slide. Okay. Now we got through the legal mumbo jumbo. We're going to go through what we're going to actually talk about today, the different, uh, the different, topics that we'll go through in order. Um, first, we'll talk about the uh, three different types of vaccines that are currently available. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll go into issues of, of vaccine availability. Um, uh, we'll go into what the uh, emergency use statute means with respect to the approval of these vaccines. Um, we will talk about potential uh, policies that employers may have, including uh, mandatory vaccine programs, as well as uh, voluntary vaccine incentive programs. Um, and we will also talk about the overall safety issue. When people are actually coming back to the workplace, you know, what, what is it that the um, OSHA, which is the organization that uh, the federal organization that looks at workplace safety, what is it that they would consider uh, in terms of what would uh, be a safe workplace for people to return to? So next slide. Okay. So what's the current lay of the land? So we've been dealing with COVID since last March and uh, most employers, I can imagine most of you all, uh, either uh, shut down your business or had to go remote for uh, a period of time. Um, and over, over time, as things have gone on and uh, things have started to open up more, um, we've been able to uh, do more things. Uh, most people are still doing virtual meetings and things such as this webinar, um, but it, it's time to start thinking about what's gonna happen as we uh, go back to in-person uh, meetings and, um, and, and an in-person workplace. Uh, so back in December, the first vaccines were uh, approved for emergency use. 
And there are currently now three vaccines that are authorized and recommended to treat COVID-19. Um, the first one, the Pfizer vaccine, uh, requires two shots, 21 days, at least 21 days apart. Uh, there's the Moderna vaccine uh, that is also a two-shot vaccine, uh, at least 28 days apart. And finally, um, the, the most recent approval was the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, and that only requires uh, one shot. So next slide. There are a couple more vaccines that um, are still in clinical trials. They may be approved soon, the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine and the Novavax uh, vaccine. So um, that will increase the supply and the variety of, of uh, COVID vaccines, um, assuming that they're going to be approved. But, but as of now, um, there are, are the three vaccines that we just talked about that are, that are approved and are being implemented and ready for use. Next slide. Okay. So over the course of time, um, when the vaccine first rolled out, and I'm sure you saw that, that uh, there was this three-phase approach that has been implemented um, to, to determine people's priority in terms of receiving the vaccine. Um, uh, and uh, Maryland has moved through the first phase um, of people who are getting the vaccine. It's now in the second phase. Um, the first phase included uh, healthcare workers, uh, residents, and uh, and healthcare workers in nursing homes, assisted living facilities, uh, other healthcare workers, first response responders, uh, um, teachers, uh, people with developmental disabilities, um, and, and now uh, people ages sixty and up. Uh, essential workers and, and several uh, types of industries and positions um, are also uh, considered uh, um, priority uh, folks to get this vaccine. Um, and Maryland has now moved into phase two, um, which is includes those over the age of 16 um, who are uh, having hospital-based treatment or have any type of medical condition that is considered a high-risk condition, diabetes, chronic kidney, kidney disease, and the like, uh, other types of, uh, of uh, conditions which would consider someone to be at high risk. Um, so uh, the, the, the vaccine is now moving through stages and ultimately, um, we'll go to the next slide, the next phase is going to be uh, the general public, um, people over the age of 16 um, and, and any healthy adults will be able to, to get the vaccine. And the way most, uh, the, the way it's worked um, is you can uh, go through this particular um, website, uh, mdvax.info or calling that number. Uh, basically you wanna, pre-register if you can, if you're going to get the vaccine uh, so that you can be aware and, and keep informed as to when slots are opening up and, and, uh, and, and where the vaccine is available. Uh, available. Uh, that website, the millinvax.info is very helpful because it tells you different places where the vaccine is being offered. Sometimes it's in drug stores, um, there are big uh, community-based centers where the vaccine is being done as well. Uh, stadiums, I did mine at M&T Bank Stadium. Um, there are, so there are gonna be very various facilities and places where the vaccine is going to be offered. Um, uh, and the president has said that uh, he suspects that most Americans will be eligible to get the COVID vaccine uh, vaccination by mid-April. Uh, we'll see if that, that happens. Um, but um, needless to say, the, the vaccine is being rolled out. Uh, many people are getting it. Um, and from my own experience, it's a very seamless process. You basically go in, um, if you've pre-registered, you show them your ID and you, know, you, you go through a line, there are people waiting, uh, you get your shot, they wait for a few minutes to um, see how you're doing and then you leave. Um, there's no payment or anything like that. 
Um, it's very straightforward and very uh, seamless. And um, uh, the one thing uh, is that when you go, it's not like you can choose which vaccine you get. You get the vaccine that's available. Um, so, you know, whether it's the Pfizer, the Moderna, um, whatever is available is the vaccine that you, that you get. So um, it's, it's being rolled out um, and they're going through the phases pretty quickly. So um, hopefully uh, by the middle of the month, uh, pe most people will be able to be registered to get the vaccine. Uh, next slide. Thanks. So what is the effectiveness of this vaccine? Well, according to the C CDC, um, vaccines are effective at keeping you from, from getting uh, COVID-19. Um, a vaccine will help keep you from getting seriously ill, even if you did get uh, COVID-19, and, and if, if for some reason um, you were still able to contract it. Uh, typically, what, what, what they're telling us from the CDC is that what COVID vaccines do is they teach our immune systems how to recognize and fight the virus that causes COVID-19. So basically, most um, vaccines, from what I understand, I'm not a doctor, but this is what's been explained to me, um, will give you a tiny dose of whatever it is you're being vaccinated against so that your body builds up the antibodies to fight that particular disease. Um, or condition. Uh, with the COVID vaccines, from my understanding, they're called what's called messenger um, vaccines, meaning that they don't actually give your body um, a small dose of COVID, but what they actually do is they make your body think you have it, so it builds up the immunity to it. Um, so um, uh, again, that's called a messenger vaccine, but basically that's what uh, it's it's um, supposed to do. So typically after you take the vaccine, it takes a couple of weeks for the body to build up the protection um, against the virus that causes COVID-19. So uh, it's possible that a person can still get uh, COVID-19 um, before or just after the vaccination uh, and get sick because the vaccine didn't have enough time to provide the protection. But the, uh, the protection is considered to be full um, after two, two weeks after you take your last dose of the vaccine. Um, from what I understand, um, some people do not um, have any effects from the vaccine at all. Other people may feel a little sick after the second vaccine, um, if, you're, if you're taking the two-dose vaccine. Um, but... Um, but it does, after two weeks, build up the immunity um, that, that you would need. So next slide. So there are some things we still don't know uh, about the vaccines, according to the CDC. Um, they're still researching this, but um, the, the, the bottom line is that while they know, or, or based on the research, that COVID vaccines are effective at keeping you from getting sick. Um, they are still learning how well the vaccines prevent um, you from spreading the virus that causes COVID-19. So even if you don't have symptoms. So um, the early data is promising. It shows that the vaccines are helpful in keeping people from uh, spreading uh, COVID-19, but we're learning more and we just don't know yet. Uh, we're also learning how long the vaccines protect people. Uh, I just saw a news release today uh, saying that the CDC says that, it, that the, with the Pfizer vaccine, it protects you at least six months. Um, so, you know, they're still learning that. This is an ever-evolving situation and don't yet know, you know what ultimately is going to happen. But um, uh, they're, they're, they're still testing these things and uh, hopefully... Um, it will keep people from spreading the virus as well. So the CDC is still recommending that you take precautions even after you've been uh, fully vaccinated when you're in public um, until we know more. So continuing with the social distancing, wearing masks and, and things like that is very important. Uh, 
Next slide. Okay, so backing up a little bit to how these vaccines got approved in the first place, okay? Um, and part of the controversy that, that many people and the conflict that some people feel with respect to these vaccines is that, you know, how do I know it's safe? You know, what, you know, this thing seems to be rushed through and they think, you know, it could be very political and, you know, people might be distrustful and feel like this is something that's being pushed upon them. Well, basically the, um, the, the COVID-19 vaccines were approved for through what's called the emergency use authorization statute. Um, and, and that's used when there is a public health emergency, which of course the COVID-19 uh, crisis is a public health emergency. Um, and that is where the FDA uh, basically speeds up its approval process, but it looks at the scientific evidence that's available um, and determines whether or not it's reasonable to believe that this particular drug, whatever it is, is effective at diagnosing, treating, or preventing a serious or life-threatening condition. Um, and whether the known and potential benefits of the product outweigh um, any potential risks. Um, and there's, and the, the, the third criteria is that there's no adequate approved and available alternative to the product for diagnosing, preventing, or preventing um, the serious or life-threatening disease or condition. So, uh, basically, the emergency use authorization statute has been in place for years, and it's for use in this type of situation. Um, so, um, next slide, please. So, there's an, a specific provision within the statute. This is the name of the statute that I have there um, that is the emergency use authorization statute. And basically, uh, what what this provision that I've cited here says is that every individual must be informed of the option to accept or refuse the administration of the product, of the consequences, if any, of refusing administration of the product and of the alternatives to the product that are available and of their benefits and risks. So basically what that seems to be requiring is that everybody has information when they're getting this vaccine of what it does, what it doesn't do, um, you know, what what the vaccine, um, you know, what, what the condition is, um, and, you know, basically giving you the facts with respect to getting the vaccine and uh, what would happen if you didn't get it. Um, next page, next slide. So the issue is really that um, this particular statute that I um, uh, quoted from is going to be important because that's now the subject of litigation with respect to people who are against um, having to uh, having a mandatory vaccine program, which is uh, what we're going to talk about now. Um, so when people say, uh, when, when as an employer, you know, you know this this vaccine is now available. It's it's starting to be. Um, made available generally. So um, now you're wondering, should I make my employees do this? Is this something that I, I, I wanna make sure that everybody's vaccinated so we can go back to having a normal workplace and everybody's able to interact closely and not have any issues? Well, here's the issue. The EEOC has said that an employer can mandate, has assumed that the, the employer can mandate a vaccination um, and even that it can exclude un unvaccinated employees from the workplace if they pose a direct threat due to a significant risk of substantial harm. But that said, the EEOC makes clear that employers must make exceptions um, uh, as required under the law um, for accommodations for people who may have um, disabilities or have a religious objection to getting the vaccine. So you have to make an individualized assessment um, to determine whether or not having an unvaccinated individual in the workplace would pose a direct threat, okay? Um, and you also have to accommodate workers who say, 
for, for disability reasons can't get the vaccine, uh, can't get the vaccine, um, or uh, for religious reasons might have an objection to it. So let's go to the next slide. Now, although an employer can make a, a vaccination program mandatory, most government agencies basically recommend that um, the uh, vaccine be encouraged, but not actually required. Um, from what I understand, the federal government is not requiring people um, who are federal government workers to get the vaccine, um, but it's educating and suggesting uh, that people consider getting it. So there are um, uh, going to be, even if, even if you do have decide that to have a, a mandated uh, vaccine program, um, you know, you have to engage in the process of, of reasonably accommodating people with disabilities uh, or who have religious objections. So with respect to disabilities, uh, this would be the same as you would with any other type of disability that an employee would have that would prevent them from doing the essential functions of their, their job. You should have an interactive process, a discussion with the employee about, you know, how their um, condition, whatever condition they might have, um, is prevents them or, or, or affects their ability to get the vaccine. So that would require getting information from a doctor, um, getting, getting information um, from the employee's physician that would uh, enable the employer to make that determination. Um, and as far as a reasonable accommodation is concerned, since the CDC has already um, said that masks uh, and social distancing are effective uh, at preventing people from transmitting the disease, that would be a, an obvious reasonable accommodation for someone who, because of a disability or for religious reasons, could not uh, safely take the COVID vaccine. Um, and so it would include any type of disabilities, including pregnancy related disabilities. All of those types of things would require a reasonable accommodation if you had a mandatory vaccination policy. Next slide, please. Uh, religious accommodation. Um, uh, in addition to accommodations for uh, disabilities, uh, an employer needs to provide uh, exemptions for people who for religious reasons have um, an objection to getting the vaccine. Now, the, um, the requirements for going through the interactive process for religious reasons are not as stringent or vigorous as those for um, uh, disability accommodation. For religious accommodation, um, it only has to be a de minimis cost or burden that would allow you to say that there's undue hardship to allowing this particular accommodation. But that said, um, yeah, again, there is a very reasonable alternative um, to, um, uh, to you know, if a person is not vaccinated, uh, basically continuing with the mask and the social distancing, uh, which we've been doing. Um, with respect to showing, the employee showing you why their religion is, is something that uh, causes them to object to something. Um, basically, the employer can ask for information about it, but basically really not much information, it, you know, an oral, the EOC has pretty much said an, an oral statement from the employee or, or that explains what their religious belief is, um, should be enough. Um, you know, there, there are other things that uh, an employee can, um, can give you, a statement from fellow adherents to that religion, a statement from a pastor, or whoever else is a, a leader in that religion can, can help as well. But I, I do stress that it has to be for religious accommodation, it has to be based on an actual um, you know, religion for, as opposed to a, a personal preference, um, but something that affects the employee's way of life. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so to the extent that the medical information is elicited with respect to um, someone getting a vaccine, 
And um, uh, it's important to remember that confidentiality um, is, is important. Now, can I, as an employer, require someone to show me proof that they've gotten the vaccination? Yes, you can certainly do that. That is not a medical inquiry. Um, you know, knowing whether or not your employees have been vaccinated um, is there's nothing wrong with asking that so that you that so that you know, um, and you know, for safety purposes, it's good to um, be able. It's good that you're able to do that, and that 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 will not violate the ADA. However, um, keep in mind that there's some information that could be shared um, that, uh, in, in terms of why an employee did not get a vaccination, okay, that would be covered by the ADA, as it might um, uh, it elicit information about a disability. So, a medical inquiry like that um, uh, is would yield information that would need to be kept confidential, meaning that you know it's, it's not shared um, around the workplace um, with anybody who doesn't have a need to know. Um, the EOC recommends that employers warn employees not to provide specific medical information as proof. I mean, you can um, say, you know, for medical reasons, I'm not able to, to get this particular uh, vaccine. Um, uh, but you just want to be careful about the amount of information that you get. Um, the, the, so basically, there, the, the ADA has a standard for disability-related inquiries. The employer must be able to show that the uh, inquiries are job-related and consistent with business necessity. So the employer would need to have a reasonable belief based on objective um, uh, evidence that an employee who does not answer the questions um, and therefore does not receive a vaccination will pose a direct threat uh, to the health or safety of, of, of herself or himself and others. So, um, and, and again, it's, this is the type of thing that just has to be handled carefully. Um, and certainly you can have the employee submit if you have uh, a, a policy that requires the employee to uh, get vaccinated, uh, you can certainly have the employee submit medical information to show why they are not able to get the vaccination. But you just, again, you have to keep this information confidential um, and, um, and, and so that it's not shared with others. Um, now, Third-party providers. If, if, now, let's say you don't have a mandatory vaccination policy that you know you basically just encourage people to get vaccinated. Um, any pre-screening questions that are asked by a third party who's getting uh, uh, who's giving the vaccination would not be subject to the, any of the ADA um, requirements because um, those are not being done on behalf of the employer. They're doing that's being done on behalf of whatever third party is actually giving the vaccine. Okay, so next slide. Um, I'm sorry. Um, the, uh, earlier I talked about the fact that there is some litigation that deals with the emergency use authorization uh, statute uh, that, through which the vaccine has been approved. Well, there was a lawsuit filed at the end of February in the District of New Mexico that uh, where the employee is taking the position that um, that being subjected to mandatory vaccination by his employer um, violates the emergency use authorization statute because the employee is supposed to be given a choice as to whether or not um, they should they the, oh, the, alter, the alternatives and uh, to getting the vaccine um, based on the emergency use authorization statute uh, provision that I read to you before. Um, there's been a second lawsuit recently filed in California uh, dealing where uh, an employee has taken the same position. So I think it's um, important to recognize that there is going to be some resistance to uh, a mandatory vaccination policy based on that emergency use authorization statute. 
Uh, we don't know how the courts are going to rule on that yet. Um, interestingly, though, uh, the EEOC, when they published their guidance, they recognized uh, that the, the, they quoted this provision from the emergency use authorization statute. Um, and the EEOC didn't seem to have any issue with thinking that an employer can still have a mandatory vaccination policy. So we'll see how this particular case goes. Um, and in, the, in this case, by the way, the employee has not been disciplined and was not fired. So the employee is still employed. Um, they're, they've objected to the vaccination and they filed this lawsuit. Uh, but we'll see what ultimately happens. So this is not something based on any disability or failure to accommodate or anything like that. This is specifically based on the fact that it is an emergency use authorization uh, statute. Next, uh, next slide. Okay, so this is a, another slide that basically talks about the same case. Um, uh, and in, in the past, uh, FDA regulations have not traditionally been applied or, or, or interpreted with respect to workplace disputes. So this is sort of a novel area uh, in, in terms of taking a look at this situation to see whether or not the emergency use authorization statute has any impact on the workplace. Next slide, please. So in addition to, and I think I just saw a comment come in about this, um, there is an effort uh, on, in various state legislatures, uh, including Maryland's, uh, to ban employers from requiring vaccinations against COVID-19. Uh, and um, the Maryland's current bill uh, that's being considered by the legislature would prohibit employers from firing employees solely because they refuse to take the COVID-19 vaccine. So thus far, as, we, as far as we know, no uh, state legislature has passed such legislation yet. They've not been successful. Um, but we don't know what's going to happen in the future. But needless to say, there is certainly a very vocal group of people who do not yet, uh, who do not believe that this vaccination should be mandated and are not comfortable taking it. So um, in, in connection, and it, it, I should also say that in, in connection with other pandemics or in, in, in connection with, uh, you know, even prior to COVID-19, the SARS and, and things of that nature, uh, healthcare employers uh, have required uh, vaccines for their employees. Um, and obviously, as a health, as a healthcare employers, just like any employer, would have to, as a mandatory vaccination policy, have to make exceptions for disability or religious accommodations, um, unless those employees who are not vaccinated would pose a direct threat to the workplace. Okay, next slide. Okay, so we've talked about mandatory vaccination programs, the pros and the cons. Now we'll talk about what I think most employers are, are doing, um, and, and that is more of the, the voluntary vaccination programs, um, trying to basically encourage people to, to get the vaccine without actually requiring it. So this would include um, education on the vaccines. Uh, the CDC website contains an entire toolkit. There's so much information that you can find on there um, about uh, the COVID-19 vaccines. It gives you the basic facts there. Um, there's a model letter that encourages employees to be vaccinated. Um, and, um, the CDC has posters that you can find. I've, I've listed the, uh, uh, the links where you can find some of these types of uh, uh, information uh, on the CDC's website um, about uh, the vaccines and even hosting a vaccine clinic. Um, uh, part of the uh, education uh, uh, component of telling people about the vaccine is showing them where they can find where they can sign up for the vaccine um, and, and giving out the information such as the website that I shared earlier uh, in this presentation that talks about how people get, uh, um, how people can, can get the vaccine. Next page. There are various uh, vaccine incentives that can also include um, 
giving people time off to get the vaccine uh, vaccine and recover from uh, getting it from any side effects, uh, any costs associated with getting the vaccine. Of course, you know, since it's not being paid for, um, uh, you know, if people aren't being asked to pay for it, it really shouldn't be much as any cost. But some people are giving out small incentives, gift cards, things of that nature for a small amount. Now, the EEOC had at one time published some guidance on this um, about saying, you know, small incentives for voluntary vaccine programs are, are okay. Um, and, and basically listing things like small gift cards and things of that nature as being um, something that is, is permissible with respect to encouraging people to get the vaccine. They've since withdrawn that guidance, um, but you know, most of us still believe that it, that is giving those small incentives that are, is okay. The problem is if you give really large, more, the, the larger the incentive or the, the more, you know, the sweeter the pot in terms of getting people to get the vaccine, it can make it seem not so much as a voluntary thing, but more of an involuntary, like you really have to do it uh, type of thing. Um, next slide, please. So um, I'm just getting into the problems with, with some of these uh, incentives to get the vaccine. Um, people who don't wanna be vaccinated may feel pressured to do so. Um, and it, it is something that can create divisions and dissensions within the workplace between people who feel like it's it's okay and that they you know that they want to be vaccinated or they want um uh, that they they feel more comfortable in the workplace if other people were vaccinated uh, and people who don't want to get the vaccine so um people who don't get the vaccine um may feel that they're being um left out discriminated discriminated against and you have to look at it this way. I mean, people who don't want to get the vaccine just because they don't want to, okay, are different from people who don't can't get the vaccine because of a disability or because they uh, of a religious reason. Those people who can't get it because of a disability or because of religion are considered a protected class. So that a policy that um, has a disparate impact meaning that it doesn't mean, didn't mean to discriminate, but in effect, it creates an impact, a negative impact on people of, on a protected class can be considered discriminatory, okay? Now, as for people who, who, who don't wanna get it just for other reasons, because they have a, you know opinion that they don't think it's, it's, it's good or safe or whatever for reasons of you know, political reasons or their own reasons, they're not a protected class. They're not a protected category. And uh, there's no claim that, that those folks would have for discrimination, okay? Um, nonetheless, the people, um, there are certain incentives that an employer, you know, again, a small incentive is, is something that, um, you know, many of our clients might, uh, uh, you know, feel is acceptable or is fine for people to get the, the vaccine. Um, and, um, you know, the, you know, so long as it isn't something that creates undue pressure on people who feel that they don't want to get the vaccine, um, that should be fine. Next, uh, next slide. Okay. Now it's also, um, interesting to note that under the latest, um, rescue plan, uh, bill that was passed by the um, uh, but passed by Congress and signed into law by the president, um, the Families First Coronavirus Act, which created a new bank of leave related to COVID-19, um, was uh, it originally expired at the end of December uh, of 2020. However, it has been extended um, through the end of September uh, 2021 on a voluntary basis, such that employers can require, can provide leave and get a tax credit for it if they, you know, if they wish to and if they qualify. So it's employers for le of less than 500 employees. So you're not required to provide the leave. However, 
Um, if you do, um, if you are covered under the uh, Family First Corona Coronavirus Act and you obtain leave and you give leave, giving leave for employer, employees who are obtaining the COVID-19 vaccine or recovering from an illness related to that, uh, to that vaccine, um, uh, giving leave for that is something that the employee, employer can, can get a tax credit for. So that is an incentive that, you know, that an employer can give to an employee that ultimately, if you take the tax credit for it, you know, you basically don't have to pay for it. So that's, that's a nice perk for employers. Next slide. Okay, uh, with respect to uh, collective bargaining obligations, I just wanna uh, mention, it's important to note that, um, uh, don't know how many of you out there actually have a union in your workplace, but even if you don't, section seven of the NLRA grants employees a right to engage in protected concerted activity. And uh, what does that mean? Well, that means that, that employees can um, uh, gather together or make a complaint for the purpose of, um, uh, of basically improving conditions in the workplace. So generally uh, speaking, there's protected concerted activity whenever two or more employees act together to improve the terms and conditions of their employment. An, exact, an example of that would be uh, protesting against a mandatory vaccination policy or the lack of one, um, any type of uh, organized communications or flyers among coworkers concerning the vaccine or a vaccine mandate um, or discussions about whether or not the employer should require the employees to get the vaccine. So employers should exercise caution um, before taking any adverse action against anybody um, who protests a mandatory vaccination policy, because such action could result in, even if you don't have a union in the workplace, an unfair labor practice charge. So basically, if you do have a union, um, then you have a collective bargaining agreement. So you just have to look and see in your collective bargaining agreement whether or not um, having a, um, a vaccination policy is something that would need to be bargained with the union over. Next slide, please. Okay, so getting to basically the, the, the really crux of the matter in terms of what employers have to do uh, with respect to the vaccine. We've talked about the vaccine policies, mandatory versus voluntary. Um, and what is your basic obligation, okay? Do you have to have a vaccine policy? You don't have to have one. Um, you, but you know, in some situations, um, you know, and a, and a landlord may ask whether or not you have a, a, a vaccine policy. So you know, there there may be situations where they can ask, and, and you might uh, be required to basically state what the policy is, or you can um, basically for or to provide workers with guidance. You know, you have a policy basically saying, "Look, here's what we're doing. We're saying, um, you know." Uh, you know, vaccines are voluntary, vaccines are mandatory. I've seen, um, you know, policies where they'll say, look, you know, if you come back to work, just let us know, have you been vaccinated? Have you not been vaccinated? Um, that kind of thing. Um, and of course the uh, employee education programs showing people how and where they can get vaccinated. Um, with respect to the ultimate um, goal of workplace safety, which is what all these vaccinations are, are about, um, OSHA expects and, and can inspect for the purpose of knowing whether or not your workplace is safe in light of the COVID-19 um, uh, pandemic. Now, has that meant or has OSHA taken the position that having people vaccinated is part of keeping, is, is required in order to have um, to meet your obligation to provide a safe uh, workplace? No, they have not taken that position. Uh, no one has said that you have to have uh, vaccinated employees in order to have a base, uh, have a uh, safe workplace. Um, however, basically what, what OSHA wants to see is are you taking proper steps to try to mitigate and prevent the spread of COVID-19 at work? Um, 
And so there are various uh, parts of what a, uh, of a prevention program uh, that OSHA recommends or, or would like to see employers um, undertake or recommends that employers take in order to keep a safe workplace. Let's go to the next slide. So uh, amongst these things, and these are things basically that the, that the uh, uh, that OSHA has published in terms of their guidance um, that would allow an employer to be able to say, hey, I'm doing what I can to try to prevent the spread of this disease. Um, you know, you basically look at your workplace, you identify ways in which, um, you know, people might be exposed to COVID-19. Um, you can have someone there to, you know, coordinate and just start a dialogue um, uh, at, with regards to COVID-19 issues so that you um, basically educate your workforce about how it spreads and um, what they need to do to stop the spread. Um, basically, um, you know, there, there are different things that, uh, and, and it'd be hard to go into all you know, all of them specifically, um, but I've listed here, what are the main, uh, the, 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 the various points of the guidance that OSHA has given. Um, so having policies is helpful. Um, you know, again, not required, but it is helpful to have a, a policy with regards to um, what to do if someone is exposed to someone who has COVID-19 with respect to what happens if somebody gets sick at work, um, guidance as far as you know, staying home from work if you feel sick, um, having um, personal protective equipment available, um, uh, depending on the type of workplace you have, or, and just basically looking at measures. What's ventilation like in your workplace? All of those types of things are important to having a safe workplace. Um, next slide. So amongst the things that, um, that employers are, are uh, being uh, expected to do uh, is doing things that um, would stop, basically slow the spread. You know, all of these types of things are, um, uh, are important to stopping the spread, including enhanced cleaning practices uh, and things of that nature uh, in order to uh, keep the spread, um, uh, keep COVID from spreading at work. Next slide. So specifically with respect to vaccines um, and, and their and vaccine availability and, and vaccine education, uh, as part of OSHA's guidance, they do talk about making the vaccine available or, or basically encouraging, um, uh, giving information about vaccine sites, um, that that employees can go to in order to get the vaccine. So basically, um, making a, making having a vaccine policy could help uh, show that you're doing what you can to to prevent the spread of COVID nineteen. And um, it's also important to know that you don't make distinctions, even though uh, the CDC has listed guidance with respect to what vaccinated individuals can do um, safely. Um, the CDC's guidance has, has um, basically said that close contact between two people who have been vaccinated, fully vaccinated, is not, um, is, is, would be safe. However, in the workplace, since you will undoubtedly have a mix of people who have been vaccinated, who haven't been vaccinated, or who are still in the stages, let's say somebody got their first vaccine, they haven't gotten their second, um, and you know they're still in the stage, or it hasn't been two weeks since they got their second, you don't know who has and who hasn't, okay? Um, it's important to keep those social distancing and mask mandates in place in your workplace to show that you're doing what you can to keep the workplace safe, even though you know, you know that people are getting the vaccination um, or, you know, you can require proof that people have gotten the vaccination. You want to, you know, make sure that for the purposes of safety, that, you know, that people still respect the social distancing and mask rules. And especially if you're dealing with people who are members of the public, because if you have a public facing business, you know, you want to make sure that everybody is kept safe 
Um, and again, you don't know who's been vaccinated and who hasn't. So that's an important thing um, in, in, in terms of making sure that you keep your workplace safe um, while these vaccinations are being rolled out. Next slide. So basically, um, you know, based on what we've gone over here, just to wrap up here, you know, you basically want to do uh, have the type of policy that best fits your workplace. You want to know uh, how to respond to employee objections and accommodation requests. Again, sometimes it'll be based on if it's based on a disability or a religion. That's one thing that you have to go through and make an accommodation. But basically, you want to listen to people in general, even if it's not based on religion or based on um, on on uh, or on a disability, I should say. So basically you wanna be uh, accommodating, you wanna understand and understand that employees may voice objections and be prepared to deal with those objections with respect to uh, this vaccine. Um, it's been a difficult time for people um, and people are just getting used to um, getting back in the flow, and being around other people, um, you know, we are, you know, where things that we used to do before without thinking about it, shaking hands with a colleague, doing things like that, high fives, things like that just aren't, they're just not going on right now. People are still a little wary. They're still getting used to coming back into the workplace. Um, so, you know, we're at a, a, a critical point where, where we're still trying to fight the spread of this uh, disease. Um, while um, also trying to keep our businesses afloat and getting people back to work to do the things that they need to do. So you need to be thinking carefully about, you know, the implications of what you do, um, the steps that you take, um, not taking discipline, you know, being careful with, with in terms of any type of discipline that you would take um, uh, and, and not being, you know, overly harsh towards people who may have objections to, to getting the vaccine. And next slide. So that is the end of the presentation. Um, and I'm happy to take with the, with the time we have left. I think we've got about at least five minutes or so. And uh, I can uh, take a few questions if we've got any in the chat or if we've got uh, uh, questions that, that people want to ask. Uh, 